for joining us this evening. Okay, it's okay for us to record, guys, because a lot of people I know want to hear from Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yes. They can't, they can't all get here. So sure. I just want to welcome you and thank you. You know, you got a bunch of energetic uh, folks down here that it became even more energetic uh, mm -hmm. Friday morning or Thursday night or whichever way you want to look at it. And so since Illinois, I mean, our, our only concern here is uh, Lauren Underwood. Other than that, you know, we don't have to worry too much about voting here in this state. But um, we do want Wisconsin and Michigan to come in on the plus side. So we want to we want to get out there and do whatever we can, either on our feet and our legs or on our telephone. Uh, but somehow or another, we got to help get out the vote. So with that, I'm going to turn the phone over to Deb, who's going to give you a proper introduction. So Deb, well, take it away. Okay. I'm not going to give a proper introduction, though, because I really want us to have as much time as we have. I would say that what we are so pleased and privileged to have here, the chair of the Wisconsin Democratic Party, Ben Wickler, and the chair of the Michigan Democratic Party, Lavora Barnes, both of whom have been chairs of the, their state parties uh, since 2019, and I think most critically, both of whom have a strategy about really organizing as not just when a campaign, particular campaign is happening, but really seeing building the Democratic Party and organizing throughout the year, every year, all the time. And I think, so what we're going to do is let Lavora and Ben each um, talk to us for 10 to 15 minutes each. If you have questions, which I'm assuming we will all have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do some Q&A afterwards, but we wanna make sure we hear from each of them first. And um, Lavora and Ben, you've seen, I think what we, I mean, obviously we're living in crazy times. You can talk to us about anything you think is important. We're really interested in what's going on in each of your states. What are the challenges? What are your strategies? both at the presidential level, but also you both have Senate races going on. You've got other down ballot races. So, um, and you know, given what's going on nationally, if you wanna comment on that as well, of course, you're welcome to do so. So with that, let's start with Lavora and again, about 10 to 15 minutes and go for it. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for, for being here and for joining me. I have to say, I've got a a little bit of a scratch in my throat, um, having spent the entire weekend talking to just about every Democrat I possibly could, reminding them that we're not going to let 90 minutes on a Thursday evening in June define this president or define our campaign. Uh, the work remains the same. We've got doors to knock, voters to talk to and work to do. And so rather than spending our time worrying, I'm telling my folks, let's spend our time working. Um, and that's the conversation I've been having <clears throat> over and over and over Price again. Um, and the it's additional thing, just so, you all know, just so you all know, my governor, Gretchen Whitmer, is not gonna run against Joe Biden, no matter how many people say that she should or that she will, she is not. And if you saw a political, Politico article that suggested that she said that we couldn't win Michigan, she didn't say it. That was incorrect. She actually had a tweet that said, anybody who says, I said that we can't win Michigan is full of shit, because that's how my governor operates. <laughs> just to be clear, we're going to win Michigan, and Gretchen Whitman is going to help me make sure that we do. So get that out of the way. So Michigan, right? Our challenges, I think many of them you already know, um, we are struggling still with uh, a, a cadre of our good Democrats who are very unhappy with our president over Gaza. It has not gone away. It has not quieted down. It still exists. There's still anger and there's still frustration. Our current strategy, which we have come to as a family, is that we are listening. We're doing a lot of listening. And what I'm hearing from the community is that they're not yet ready to hear us say, come vote for Joe Biden. They're hearing us say, we will listen to you and we will pass on your concerns. And that is what we're doing. We hired just this week, three new fellows to work in our co coalitions department who are young Arab Americans who are happily going into their community, continuing those conversations with a specific outreach to young folks. Um, they are fired up and ready to do that work. They are ready to post it on social media and talk about it as well. 
So we're very excited to see that program kick into it let yet another level. Um, I think those, those kids are going to be great. The other place we are very focused in terms of bringing back together that coalition that helped us win in 2020, African-Americans. Um, we are putting together a strong African-American mobilization program it is going to be led by uh, a former state senator who was running for Congress in a primary against Sri Thanadar and got removed from the ballot because of some signature issues and is now willing to put all of the money that he raised toward that race and all of his energy toward mobilizing Black votes and working hard to turn out the Black vote. So we've got a program separate from what the Biden campaign is doing in terms of Black outreach that we are leading from inside the party with, with Adam Hollier is his name and, and two additional coalitions organizers working with Adam. We're very excited about these two additions to our program, sort of taking it up another notch um, to make sure that we're doing all we can to have good conversations and strong outreach in those two vital communities, because we know we need them in order to secure the victory. And that victory needs to be secured, of course, from the bottom of the ticket to the top. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the other races that are on the ticket. You all mentioned U.S. Senate race. We've got to fill the very large and very important shoes of Senator Debbie Stabenow. We've got a primary right now. Um, it is likely that Alyssa Slotkin will come out of that primary. I say likely because nothing is for certain, um, but it feels very likely that she will. And when she does, she will be facing a very tough Republican opponent. She's raising money. She is doing voter outreach. She's on the doors. She's doing all the work that she needs to do to get through the primary and get through to the general election. I will note that her opponent in the primary is Hill Harper, who some of you may have seen on TV, who's actually running a pretty strong and active campaign and is firing up a lot of folks in the Black community to turn out to support him, which is why it is not a given that Alyssa will win that primary, but it is likely. Hill has also promised that if he doesn't win that primary, or even if he does win that primary, his goal is to also help us continue to energize the Black vote and turn folks out. So we're excited to bring Hill into the fold post-primary to help us work on making sure we are doing all we can to do our Black outreach and do our turnout. Next thing down the ballot, we have a couple of congressional seats we're paying a lot of attention to. We want to protect Hillary Scolton. Hillary is in a much better seat post-redistricting than she was when she ran, but she does have actual opposition and we need to make sure that we're taking good care of her. Um, she actually has a primary, but it's a very fake primary. So we're ignoring it and continuing to support her, even though um, Republicans have figured out that if they jump into some of our primaries, we might not spend money because that's what our rules say. Um, and that's, that's a new tactic that we're discovering here in Michigan. Um, so I've decided to ignore it when they jump in, because if you're obviously a Republican, I can still work for the actual Democrat in the primary. That's at least how I'm interpreting our rules. So that's what we are doing. Um, I'd also love to talk a little bit about the seat Alyssa Slotkin is leaving. It's a tough seat in the Lansing area. You know, she worked hard to win it and hold it. The on. man running for it is Curtis Hertel, who has been active in politics and was a member of the legislature. Really terrific candidate, working hard, raising money. Um, if you've got some time on the phones, Curtis is asking folks to do phone calls from him. And he is... Um, very, very, very excited about taking that seat. And I think he'll do a great job running and also being a member of Congress. And then we're still looking at Michigan 10, which is where John James won by the skin of his teeth last cycle. We we're finally, I think, got the D trip to at least pay a little bit of attention to that seat. That's a seat where we have a primary. Also, once we get through that primary, we'll be all in working hard. That's in the Macomb County area of Michigan. If you guys know your Michigan, I would hold up my hand and do the thumb, but you, you all know where it is. We've got a state house, which is only uh, a two seat margin. Um, very tough to get things done when you only have a two seat margin. They just battled through to get the budget done um, this past week. Um, our goal always has been to grow that majority for the state house. I'm being a little bit more realistic and I'm starting to say, we're gonna hold that majority for the state house, but whatever we do, we are not losing that majority for the state house. So we are on the doors, we're on the phones. The state house members are out of session now because they finished the budget and they are at home talking to their constituents, talking to voters, doing the work they need to do. Our Project 83 team is leaned in deeply on these state house races. Um, we've got a couple of potential pickups in the state house arena, but we are very focused on making sure we hold on to that majority. And then the other place, not a lot of people hear us talk about, well, 
you should be hearing us talk about, but not a lot of people think about. Supreme Court, again, for us, very important. Um, and all the victories that we had in 2022, we weren't able to bring Tyra Harris Bolden across the finish line for Supreme Court. The marvelous Governor Whitmer appointed her to an open seat on that Supreme Court, but now we've got to get her elected to that seat. So that's happening this fall. And then, I don't know if we chased him out or if he just decided he was finished, but one of the Republicans has stepped out and decided not to run for re-election on the Supreme Court. And we've got a terrific candidate out of Ann Arbor, and she's not just terrific because she's from Ann Arbor, which is where I'm from. She's also happens to be terrific. Her, her, her name is, is Kim Thomas, and she is running for that uh, open Supreme Court seat. So we've got a, an opportunity here not just to protect our majority on the Supreme Court, but to grow it. Um, if we don't manage to do that, we will be, I believe, the only state, if we lose both of these, that will actually go backwards in terms of um, uh, liberal versus conservative. So we have to we have to hold the Supreme Court. It is where everything lands these days in the courts. And these courts become so much more important than anything else that we do for some, for many reasons, um, from redistricting to to the, the the rights that we have worked so hard to get in terms of voting rights and women's rights and all of that, all, all lands in the Supreme Court in one way or another. So we have to make sure that we protect that Supreme Court. Um, in terms of the places where we're working hard, and we talked a little bit about Arab Americans, we talked a little bit about African Americans, I would say the west side of the state continues to be the place where we are growing in terms of our ability to, to find and elect Democrats. I think that like folks should be continue to paying attention to Kent County, which is where Grand Rapids is, Muskegon County, um, yeah. Grand Traverse County, where we are about to flip a flip flip the county commission to Democrat for the first time. Those folks could absolutely love use some extra voices, hands, and feet. Um, and then, of course, on the east side of the state, Macomb County, always a tough, tough place for us. Also, a hard place for us to actually find in field volunteers. So if we've got folks who know folks who live in Macomb County or are willing to make calls Which in would you Macomb like to County, eat? that's incredibly helpful as well. Can and then, as always, okay. any of our urban centers, um, Detroit, Pontiac, Flint, um, Saginaw are places where um, we have to turn out the vote. And we're very focused on turning out the vote, obviously. And we're doing what we call a, a persuade to participate program where we're reminding Dems why this election is important, why their voice is important and not to allow others to take away their voice in this election, but to participate as a voter um, and not just a protester on the side, but show up and actually vote. So that's what's happening in Michigan. I would love to answer questions when we get to that point, but I'm gonna stop there and let Ben tell us about Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Lavora. Let's give round of God, your voice, Ben. <laughs> We are <clears throat> all in the same boat in this business these days. Um, it's such a pleasure being on the Zoom with you, Lavora and Deb, and all the Chicago women who take action. Uh, it's I I think I joined you last in 2021, and what a what a lot has happened since that conversation. Holy smokes! Uh, I'm really glad to be here at this moment because this feels like one of those weeks where we either lose it, lose our heads collectively, or we get it together and focus in a moment that will decide the fate of American democracy. So I'm really glad that everyone is fired up, that there are dozens of people here. Um, I want to give you a sense of what's happening in Wisconsin that takes a little bit of history, because in Michigan, they have already walked the road that we are trying to walk in Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, we're at the midpoint. So Michigan and Wisconsin are two states that went from blue trifectas to red trifectas in 2010. Two states with deep progressive histories, with labor histories, with histories of struggle, histories of work for justice for all, for racial justice, for gender justice, for all the different things that all of us share values around. And I grew up in a state that prided itself as a birthplace of the progressive movement. And then in 2010, the Republicans swept in and they started smashing and dismantling everything that had made Wisconsin a, a state that was uh, a laboratory for democracy in the best sense and made it a laboratory for autocracy. So mm -hmm. like Michigan, we became a right to work state where we had uh, went from being a very proud, strong union state to a state where unions were decimated. Like Michigan, Republicans ripped away voting rights. Like Michigan, was Republicans uh, gerrymandered our state to high heaven. And we had a Republican state Supreme Court, Republican governor, Republican attorney general, and Republicans in total control of both chambers of our state legislature. 
for a long time. It took three elections to defeat Scott Walker. 2018, we won by 1.1 percentage point in the governor's race. Uh, Michigan was 10 points. We're a little jealous of that. But we managed to win that election. Uh, you were here for that fight. In 20, uh, 2019, I was elected chair and started uh, working to build on my, my predecessor's work to build year-round statewide organizing in every community in our state. 2020, the COVID pandemic hit. The Republicans that overrode, the, or the, the governor insisted that the spring election for Supreme Court should be delayed like other elections across the country were delayed. Republicans sued, got our right-wing state Supreme Court to override the governor. We had the first COVID pandemic election, but we won the state Supreme Court race that year. We organized straight through to November. We won the presidential race in Wisconsin by six tenths of one percentage point. Again, I'm a little jealous of Michigan's bigger margin, but we won. We were the tipping point state in 2020 in Wisconsin. Then Republicans sued to try to overturn our election, just as they tried to overturn the election in Michigan. And because we'd won our state Supreme Court race in the spring, we survived that by one vote on our state Supreme Court. It came closer than any other state, I would argue, to having the election overturned. So then we go into 2022 cycle. And once again, Republicans are on the march trying to dismantle our democracy. They lay out their plan. They lay out their plan. If they win, the gubernatorial candidate says Republicans will never lose an election in Wisconsin again. The state Supreme Court, the right-wing state Supreme Court, overrides the governor's veto and chooses the gerrymandered maps that the state legislature had proposed. So our, our gerrymander gets even worse, the worst, I think, in the history of the country, certainly in the, in the entire country by the time it passed. And as we move towards November, we look in the history books, the last time a Democrat won a governor's race in Wisconsin, when there was a Democrat in the White House, because it's always the, the backlash effect, the last time was 1962. So the odds are not in our favor. But the anti-MAGA coalition, it doesn't just hold, it grows. We win our governor's race this time by triple the margin, 3.4%, which in Wisconsin is a true landslide. We hold off the Republican supermajority in the state legislature by two votes, total a margin of 2,499 uh, 2 votes cast. So we have two assembly seats to hold off Republicans overriding the governor's veto. And the governor vetoes dozens of election subversion and voter suppression bills, and the legislature cannot override that veto. 2023, we finally win the majority on our state Supreme Court in another titanic battle. And then Republicans respond by trying to impeach our new Supreme Court justice. And it takes a massive organizing effort to stop them from removing the Supreme Court justice who the voters had just decided. This was their attempt to overturn yet another election. And after all that, our state Supreme Court declares our gerrymandered maps unconstitutional. And it brings us to this moment. Now, Michigan has ballot initiatives and Lavora and the Michigan Dems have done this incredible job of collecting signatures and securing reproductive freedom and abortion rights and fair maps and voting rights through the ballot initiative process. Wisconsin does not have this process. The only way to get a question in front of voters is to pass it through back-to-back -back sessions of our state legislature. So for us, the only way we can do this is winning elections and putting people in office who share our values. But now we have a chance. This moment, when everyone is you know, running around trying to figure out what's gonna happen next, in Wisconsin, we know exactly what we have to do. And we've been organizing for the last eight years to build up to this election. With these fair maps, if we win a majority of the votes for the state assembly, then we can win a majority of the seats in the state assembly and end Republican control of our state assembly, which they have Republicans have used to devastating effect, but we can use to start making things better. If we do our job, we can flip four state Senate seats. If we do that now, it means we will get the majority in 2026, even if it's a tough year, because the, the seats that are up in 2026 are more favorable to us. So if we do our job now, then Republicans cannot get the trifecta in 2026, and we can. In the U.S. House, we have two different state U.S. House seats that are flippable, including the first congressional district just north of Chicago. So Chicago women, come up to the first congressional district. Go to Racine, go to Kenosha, go to Walworth County, knock on doors, talk to people. You can flip a U.S. House seat and an assembly seat and a Senate seat at the same time as you reelect Tammy Baldwin for the United States Senate and help us win the presidential election in a state where four of the last six presidential races comes down to less than one percentage point. And I should mention the eighth congressional district, very tough in terms of the map, but we have an amazing candidate, Kristen Lyerly, running who would be the first pro-choice OBGYN elected to Congress. 
running in an open seat where the Republican who wasn't mega enough stepped down. And now there's a mega fest to figure out which of the far, far right wing candidates will be the nominee. So we have fights at every one of those levels. Then we have Tammy Baldwin's race, one of the, I would argue, top five Senate races in the country. If we do everything to help her, she will win. If we take our foot off the gas, it gets very dicey because her opponent is a mega self-funder who's talking about putting $50 million of his own money into his race in order to buy a U.S. Senate seat. So you cannot take it for granted, but know that Tammy is a dynamite senator, dynamite candidate, dynamite campaigner. So if we do all that we need to do, I have, I have every confidence that she will prevail. And then we have the presidential race. And I want to be real, folks, it is tied in Wisconsin right now. It is, I don't have new polling post-debate, but I can tell you that we knocked on more than 30,000 doors this past weekend across our state. And when you go out and talk to voters, they already thought Joe Biden was old. The president, the, the presidential debate for the voters who are undecided, who might not vote, or they might vote either way, this was already baked in. It's only the weirdos like all of us who've been paying attention, who saw the State of the Union address, who've seen Joe Biden knock it out of the park, who were shocked and dismayed because the debate was so rough. But if you're just a, a political civilian and you try to avoid political news because it stresses you out, what you're seeing is viral clips of Biden's worst moments. And we kind of just had an extended version of that during the presidential debate. So what we're seeing on the ground is that that actually did not cause the kind of uh, freak out among the the low information general population of voters that it did among the activists like all of us. All of us want to see the, the Joe Biden at his best that we we love cheering for, but this was already kind of priced into the polls. The striking thing for me is how many voters had not been paying attention to what Trump has been up to who watched that debate. We heard from tons of voters this weekend that they watched that debate and were shocked when Trump said he wouldn't accept the results of the election unless he decided it was free and fair. They were shocked when he was talking about black jobs and Hispanic jobs and the casual racism was appalling to voters, even though for all of us who are paying close attention, none of that was surprising in the least because we see it from Trump all the time. This this is a, a race that, while I wish the debate had been different from the way it was, this was a debate that kind of reinforced for people what the stakes are and what the choice is based on what they previously thought that they knew. And in this environment, before the debate and my senses after the debate, it is tied, it is within, as we say, the margin of effort. This is an election that we can win by working harder than the other side. This is an election we can win by going door to door and talking to voters, by making those phone calls, by doing the direct voter contact work and chipping in to support hiring more organizers across our state. If we do that, if we grind it out, we can win like we won in each of those races, in the Supreme Court race in 2020 and in 2023, like we won the state legislative races, like we won the governor's race, like we won with Joe Biden in 2020. It takes that work. But if we keep our focus we can do this. And if we do this, we can not only avert a Trumpian catastrophe, we can also win down ballot in a way that will fundamentally change the future of our state. I can say we in Wisconsin do not like being the one state in the upper Midwest that has not expanded Medicaid. We don't like being the state where it is hardest to vote of any upper Midwestern state. We're the fourth hardest state to vote in the entire country. We're the second hardest state to register to vote in the country. And by the way, if we don't win the assembly this time, Republicans are going to take their voter ID law, which massively cut especially Black turnout in the state of Wisconsin, because Republicans knew that more than half of Black Wisconsinites don't have driver's licenses. They knew that when they passed a law that requires a driver's license or another ID you get from the Department of Motor Vehicles, when they passed it into law, a whistleblower said Republicans were giddy and frothing at the mouth when they were briefed on the impact on Black voters when they passed that law. Republicans want to put it into the Constitution. And if they win the assembly this time, they'll be able to pass it through the state legislature and send it as a ballot uh, as a ballot question before the voters. But if we stop them, we can change that law. We can become the multiracial democracy that Wisconsin aspires to be now and has been at our best. We can become a proud progressive neighbor to the north of all you Illinoisians, and our 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 uh, friendly Illinois neighbors can travel to Wisconsin and to Michigan knowing that wherever they might go, they can get the reproductive health care that they need. Uh, hopefully, they can travel to Wisconsin to buy marijuana the way that Wisconsinites currently travel to Illinois to buy marijuana. 
And we become an upper Midwest that is a true blue wall, not just in the Electoral College, but in upholding the principles of American democracy that we're all fighting for. So these are the stakes at this moment, and it is such close election. And I'm so grateful for everyone here to help us get to this point and for all that you're gonna to do to help us cross the finish line. With that, I'll turn it back over to, to you guys and excited okay. to have the conversation. So thank you both so much. And um, I actually, then I just have to say, I think I've noticed that too. I feel like in some ways, even though I didn't like necessarily what I saw at the debate, but it's almost made me more committed because the stakes and what the Supreme Court has been doing, it's so clear, it's in sharp relief why we have to win in November. So I, and hopefully you're right. And that's how other voters are feeling too. Um, so what we're gonna do is we've asked people to put some questions in the chat and Mary Driscoll is gonna help us moderate this conversation. And Lavora, I hope this is okay. We thought if there are any specific questions for Ben, we would take them first because Ben has to yes. leave, has a hard stop at 645, although we're doing okay on time. So, but Mary, do you have some questions? Uh, no, I don't have any questions for Ben, but Kathy okay. Nolan has a comment in the chat. Sure. If she wants to say it aloud. You're muted, Kathy. Yeah, I know. Um, well, I know. I think I'm on in a little bit. So, um, but I just wanted Ben to know when he shouted out the thirty thousand that like a thousand of those were the thirty five people we sent up on Saturday to Canvas and Racine and Kenosha, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit when you're finished with the questions. But um, how you guys can join us. But it was it was exactly as you said it was. Um, talking to like folks who were not all that engaged and were really, really good to talk to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please thank every one of those volunteers who came up. That how we win. Um, are there any other? Are there any questions for Ben before we move on to a question for uh, Devora for Lavora? Uh, Ask the, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take turns. No need to come to me first. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So then there is a question from Betty Magnus for Lavora. Betty, do you want to ask your question? Yes. So Lavora. Hi, Betty. Uh, how you doing? I'm all right. Good. I mean, I go way back in Michigan with Annette Rainwater and one of my really good wow. friends is Virgie Rollins. So Love me some Miss Virgie. To, yeah. <laughs> I am wondering where are the union members that he, the president, walked the picket line with? Yeah. Why aren't they making more noise at this point in Michigan? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. So our our UIW members who have been, uh, you know, the the folks that the president walked the line with, they have they have been mobilizing their folks. They're doing uh, neighbor to neighbor union union member to union member doors. Um, talking particularly to their their folks who are on the fence, trying to move them toward President Biden and the Democrats. They are working very hard at that, but they are very sort of focused inwardly right now because they want to deliver labor votes for Joe Biden. So we may not see all of their communications because they are doing so inwardly to make sure that they're trying to move that needle. And they're also working with their retirees um, to make sure that all their right retirees are participating. But they're out there, they're doing the work. They know that President Biden had their back and they are intent upon having his as well. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. You know, we had our annual dinner that the, it wasn't last week. I don't know when it was, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, and the, the UAW was about half the room and uh, they were loud and fired up for the vice president. It was, it was a great night. The, the, the union folks are there. They're strong. Okay. I don't see any other questions. No, Mary, Mary. Jackie's got her, her hand up. Oh, she's Mary. not my name, but she's talking. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Susan's computer. But uh, Ben, uh, Lavora mentioned the uh, young people in Gaza. What's the attitude in Wisconsin uh, about Gaza, uh, the Gaza fight and the president's position with Israel? Good point. It is 
it is certainly something, especially for for younger voters, uh, that is of great concern. And so we've seen protests at the University of Wisconsin Madison, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. I will say that there's a lot of campuses where we haven't seen it. It tends to be at the you know the couple of biggest schools in the state. Uh, when you poll students, it is not the number one issue that comes up. It tends to be the biggest issue for the most passionate students. And I think the critical thing is their engagement, what they see as being at stake in the election helps to set the tone for the students that are less political. And you know, as a campaign, we are also doing a lot of listening. We're engaging with a lot of people. There are also some uh, Wisconsinites, especially in the Jewish community that are, are con deeply concerned by anti-Semitic incidents, which we've also seen and, and you know, wanna make sure that while people have objections to U.S. foreign policy with regards to Israel and, and to what um, Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing, um, that that doesn't bleed into anti-Semitism and, and kind of divide us as a, as a community. And so as a party, we're firmly against anti-Semitism, against Islamophobia, and in favor of uh, success for the president's work to get a ceasefire, hostages home, have a resolution, have a flood of humanitarian aid in. Uh, the the work the president's doing for an enduring peace is the thing that could bring people together the most when that when that comes to fruition. In the, the, the same time, it's clear right now that people aren't kind of experiencing this as a choice election. People are advocating for policy change now. They want to see policy change now and they want to see the war end now. I think when we're in October, November, uh, you know, the, the beginning of November, the the choice between the Trump administration that's talking about sending American troops in to break up protests and deport protesters uh, versus President Biden, who believes that protesting is a First Amendment right, that becomes more salient if we're still in the middle of a, of a crisis like you know, the way that we've been for uh, for these last many months. So you can see in the overall polls, Wisconsin is right on a knife's edge. And this is one of, you know, a lot of things that people have very deep feelings about. Um, but I also think there's a, a, a real path forward here. And I, last time I saw the president in person, I told him that nothing would bring our coalition together more powerfully than a ceasefire. And he said, we are working as hard as hell on it. So I, I wish him the the very best of success with that. Is, is there an initiative for young voters uh, around around uh, the, the issue in Gaza or just in terms of getting out the build period? Yes. So we have an enormous youth and campus organizing program at the party. We have uh, dozens of youth organizing staff that uh, we brought on in the spring, trained for doing things over the summer, and then will be from the first day of school when people come back in the fall. We have a high school Democrats of Wisconsin organization that is sprouting new chapters all over Wisconsin. So we want to get every high school senior out to vote. Um, and then there's also big projects being uh, undertaken through independent groups to do campus organizing work. So there's a ton of work to being uh, being done on that front. And you know, we know that there's a number of issues, including this, also including reproductive freedom and, and abortion rights and access to contraception, birth control, um, and also issues like gun violence and LGBTQ inclusion and racial justice that are deeply motivating to young voters. And we wanna to speak to them on, about all those different issues as we move towards the election. Thank you, awesome. Sure. There is a question in the chat uh, from Judith Singleton. Judith, would you like to ask your question? Sure, uh, and I'll even show my face. <laughs> wow. Hi. <laughs> so yeah, my question just concerns your comment about the fact that once you talk to voters about Thursday night's debate, that voters were not that surprised. Uh, and so um, there is concern out there about Joe Biden's mental acuity. And I think especially if he is able to move forward in the next four years in the job of being president. So I guess my question is, how, what do you say to voters who do have those concerns and especially younger voters? I mean, I certainly know he has a fantastic record, right? Um, but but That's what do you question. say? But what do you say to voters who do not have as much information and who are concerned and saw what they saw? You can't deny. Mm -hmm. I'll say the, the first thing that I say when 
you know, in, in conversations like this is watch this clip from North Carolina the next day. When people, you know, people saw Biden really in the worst moment that he's had in the public spotlight. Um, and there's all kinds of context for how that happened and moments he was looking at the countdown clock instead of at the camera and so forth. Um, but just seeing him show up in a totally different way uh, that night at the post-election speech and then at the Waffle House and then the next day in North Carolina, I mean, over and over. And most of the time, the people have the biggest concerns have not actually seen him when he's, you know, his normal self. And so seeing that can be a real sea change moment and people's the kind of gears in people's heads change. And then I talk about the you know what President Biden's been able to do in office. We can we don't have to wonder what he'd be like as president because we actually have direct information about what's happening right now. And it does make a a really big difference to you know to put it into the context of all that. I'm also aware uh, I happened to listen to this NPR show yesterday called On the Media. And they talked about um, the how the rumors about his mental acuity started. And it started with a global media company that is known to be the arm of the Republican Party. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that the narrative is baked into the public. And is there anything that can be done about it at this stage to shift it? I, I I'm not so sure. I don't know. I uh, I'll I'll defer to Lavorda for for further reflections. The one thing I'll say is the more Biden is out there speaking and delivering forcefully and energetically, the the more chances we have to chip away at that narrative. But I think that there is to some you know there's some voters who will never be persuaded now because they've heard yeah. this from the Fox News and and Rupert Murdoch empire for a long time. But Lavor, I'd love your right. thoughts on this. No, no, Ben, you're exactly right, and. Um, I think that the the more people see and hear from him, the more they will recognize that that the man they saw Thursday night is not the totality of who Joe Biden is. I know Ben, ben and I are are luckier than most because he comes to our states, um, so folks do get the opportunity to see him. I stood on a porch in the rain with the president for an hour and a half and watched him interact with people and answer questions off the cuff, no teleprompter, just Joe and a bunch of random strangers on a porch in Michigan. And he was brilliant, brilliant. Um, so I, I think that getting him out there more, showing him um, in, in, in a more comfortable space than standing six feet from Donald Trump, um, I think we will see and people will be able to see who he is and be reminded of, of the, the brilliance that is Joe Biden. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Uh, Thank someone you has question. their hand up here. It's Jackie or Susan. Su who is it? Or or Susan, maybe they muted. didn't put it down. You're no, muted. it's me and I wanted it up. It's not Jackie. Susan, you, you had a comment though. If yeah. You so I I it. have a comment on um I'm I'm feeling completely shell shocked, frankly, because I feel like I'm being gaslighted by optimistic Democratic Party officials about Joe Biden's competence to engage in a back and forth. Um, and I am somebody who goes out and knocks on doors always during campaigns. I've been a loyal Democrat since my dad put an Adlai Stevenson button on me in 1956. But it's, you know, I think there has to be more frankness about what has gone on because to see Joe Biden bluff an easy question about reproductive rights and take a turn into what seemed like a Trump talking point about a little girl who got killed was to me absolutely scary. And the other, I'm just putting up these like slightly negative comments. I love what you're saying about the organizing on the ground in Wisconsin, which I love, and Michigan, where I went to law school and know the whole state. But, and what but what you're telling us to count on is the ignorance of people who did not see those moments. The other moment in the next couple of weeks, and I forget what the date is, it's going to be very difficult for us, is when Netanyahu speaks to a joint session mm -hmm. of Congress. Mm -hmm. That is not an optic we should have if we've been making any progress on the very competent stuff that Ben was talking about, that the administration wants a ceasefire, that the administration wants a ceasefire, to see Netanyahu embraced by leadership of Congress is going to set that back a good month. So I am not 
optimistic. I wish I could be as optimistic as you guys are, but you know, I'm a union member, I'm a Democrat, but I just think it's going to be a very hard sell going door to door. Thank you. I, Thanks I, for I, your I, work. You're doing a great job. Thank you. And I appreciate your your comments about Netanyahu and I I I hear you and I agree. I don't I don't think that there's a single member of our our youth caucus or any of our, our young folks on our campuses who is not angry and frustrated that this is happening and will be even more angry and frustrated when it happens and after it happens, not to mention a couple of my members of Congress. Um, it is it is yeah. it is it is going to be a rough moment. For I just all of saw us Rashid again. over the week. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say about the optimism, you know, my, my optimism comes from my, my actual lived experience of being next to Joe Biden. Um, it's not just me sugarcoating the moments that he had on Thursday night. I, I have seen him recently, um, spent time with him, watched him interact with people, watched him respond to questions. It's not, um, I recognize that Thursday was jarring for a lot of folks. It was jarring for me as well, because it is very unusual, because again, I've seen him more recently probably than most folks, because he comes here. Um, and I, I will just tell you honestly that that's, that's not the Joe Biden I have seen on the ground here in Michigan, not the Joe Biden I have spent time with on porches and in rooms in this state. Um, and uh, he had a bad night. And I, I love that you called it a moment because that's what it was. It was it was a bad, bad moment. But um, I think that as we move through this, we'll see more, much, much better moments out of our president. And uh, ho hopefully folks will um, maybe not forget, but at least recognize that that was indeed just a moment. I appreciate it. I'll chime in as well. I, I hear you. I think when you're watching mostly good moments and then you watch that, it can feel like gaslighting because it's like, wait a minute, has that guy been there all along and is being hidden from me? And I think that that for, especially for tuned in people, like all of us on the call and the, and friends who pay attention to the news, it was it was particularly shocking. I will also say, you know, like Lavor, I've had this experience. He's, he's been here multiple times this year, four times this year already. And I've seen him on his feet for hours, giving speeches and then giving speeches at a small group and then doing a photo line and having authentic interactions with a string of different people, explaining things, coming over, checking in with my staff, talking to them, like being briefed. And it's just, it is, you know, I'm sure he has bad moments. We just saw one in public. I'm sure there's lots of other ones. I also know he has a ton of really good moments, like really good. I have, I have the moment that sticks in my head was he was doing a photo line and a little girl came in wearing cat ears and she said, I'm a cat. And he said, meow. And it was like the most delightful and completely present million percent unscripted thing that he could possibly have done. And that's, you know, I, I want more people to see more of that Joe Biden because he's right there. And I, I think that that's our biggest opportunity is for people to see that. Um, and with that, I do have to go. I'm so sorry, but I'm so grateful to everyone here for your work. And I'll turn you back over to LaVar for these last few minutes of conversation. Really, really grateful to everyone. Well, and thank you, Bye, ben. thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. It was great. Thank you. Yeah, but hopefully LaVora can stay a little bit. Do I can, yes. Questions, Mary? I think I have. Uh, no, I don't see any more questions. I actually have a question that I put in the chat, so I don't know why you don't see it. No, I see it. <laughs> so I will, I will ask it since I'm off mute now anyway, which is as we go phone banking and canvassing, I'm curious now, Lavora, what you think um, sort of the most effective. So like, you know, we've, most of us on this call have done this in various campaigns for years and years and years. And so in this situation, a couple of things I'm thinking, do you find that voters are more interested in hearing about all the great things that Biden has done do you think, on the other hand, it's better for us to be talking more like our vision for the future and not even just sort of the Democratic Party official vision for, but our per, our vision as progressives, I would say, vision for the future, but tying it into that the only way we have a chance at that is by voting Democratic this year. Um, you know, and actually I heard from some people who've done some canvassing and they were saying they're also focusing on talking about the difference in sort of the teams, you know, so not mm. so much focusing on Biden or Trump, the person, but on 
what do we get when we vote Democratic versus what do we get when we vote Republican? So do you have some advice from your experience and how you think voters are most, what they respond to most? Yeah, I, I, I like how you, how you couch that last comment about uh, telling the story of the difference between the teams. We do that a lot here in Michigan, um, a lot because that, that contrast is so evident and strong right here in Michigan as our Republican Party goes as far off of the crazy deep end as the Republican Party can go. And our Democratic trifecta again and again and again moves policy that actually better is the lives of Michiganders. So we can very honestly tell the story of the difference that it makes when you elect Democrats to leadership. So we do talk about that a lot. I think the most effective interactions with voters for volunteers are when you make it personal and you tell your own story. Um, we give everybody talking points as, as information for you to have if you are asked a question, but I never want our volunteers just reading a script or a talking point at the doors. The days of doing that should be long past. We should be having conversations with voters about what, why am I a Democrat? Let me tell you why I'm a Democrat, right? Let me ask you what issue matters the most to you, and then I'll tell you why that issue is an issue that's important to me and the Democrats, and here's what the Democrats are going to do about it. That's the conversation that is, I think, so much stronger than just spouting a bunch of talking points at someone or reading a script or just going, well, you vote for Joe Biden, yes or no, right? I think so those, those are the ways we train our folks to, to have those conversations. And I bet a bunch of you just do that naturally, even if it's not part of your training, because it's just an easier conversation and easier door when you start with, let's just have a talk. Yeah, that's great. I, I agree with that. Okay. I don't see any other questions. And Deb, your question is not in my chat. At any so oh, there is a question. Mary, Mary Ann Johnson, you have a question? No. Close the chat. Okay. Any anybody else? I don't see anything. Oh, Marianne, is that you? No. Ann Armstrong. Ann yes, Armstrong. Sir. Sorry. Ann Ar Ann Judith. Yeah. I I have found um, I haven't gone door to door, um, but I'm involved in a brand new group that we're going to be doing some things. Um, we've got some dates, but, but I have found in just the people I've talked to who've been mostly Democrats, um, the important thing is to is to show some confidence and and to say i believe in joe you know you they need to hear somebody say it's okay to go ahead and vote for joe biden and um and i say to them you know being president is not answering questions in 2 minutes time or responding to somebody who's telling a bunch of lies so fast you can't you can't uh, fact check them all. It's a whole different skill set, and he's got it, and um, and we know that because he's shown us that. So I think part of the job is turn just right, to, then turn just, left. Is just to restore, give give somebody a reason to to get their confidence back. I like that. That's really good. good. And, and to be confident yourself, don't don't go into it with a wish. I had somebody measure. somebody asked me point blank, "Do you think he can win?" And I said, "Yes." Yes. Boom. Exactly. And then and they said, "Do you think he will win?" I said, "I think likely he will." We do the work. He will. Judith, you have a question. Yes. Thanks so much, Lavora, and thanks for all your work. I've campaigned and many elections in Michigan. Thank you. And, you know, it was great for Obama. I mean, people hugged us. <laughs> um, we could tell with Hillary that people were just not going to vote. Um, what are you hearing will get people excited? And, and it's probably different for different parts of the state, for different groups. I mean, at this point, it may change in September. But at, at this point, you know, how is it evolving and and what's getting different groups excited? I have to say that, that a lot of the excitement we are hearing on the ground right now is for what's happening further down the ballot. 
more excitement than what's happening at the top of the ticket. There are a lot of people who are very fired up about our Supreme Court and making sure that we return Kyra Harris Bolden. Um, there are a lot of people concerned about the state house. Um, you know, they've watched this legislature move a lot of important legislation, but know that there's more work to be done and they want to protect that state house. So we are sort of leaning in deeply on our local organizing and our local work and sort of hoping that we can push up votes um, from the local rather than expecting the coattails from the top that, you know, we would love to have, but we're not sure we're going to have. So we're talking to our state house candidates about, you know, as you're talking to voters, let's remind them that they can vote straight ticket because we have straight ticket voting here in Michigan. And that scoops up all the Democrats, like vote straight ticket and then go find um, the, the Supreme Court on your ballot. And not always a direct conversation, particularly from the state house candidates about the top of the ticket, but more about here who's here's who I am, Here's why I'm running. Here's why this legislative seat is important to your everyday life. And while I've got you, please vote straight ticket. Thank you. That makes sense. <laughs> that's where we are now. It, it may change. It's July, right? And the excitement may turn, but that's that's where we are right yeah. now. Yeah. So I don't see any more questions. Okay. In the chat. So I'm turning it back over to Deb. So. Okay, and Lavora, thank, you, thank so, you so, so much. And hopefully you will see some of us coming up to Michigan. And in fact, that's that's where we're going now. We don't want people to leave here. This wasn't just about us listening and understanding. We really want us all to start committing, if we haven't done so already, to be involved. So we've asked um, Kathy Folan, who is a CWTA member, and also, Yay. also the chairperson of Indivisible Chicago Alliance nice. to talk a little bit about what Indivisible is doing. And we have some opportunities for all of us immediately to sign up for. And what we're hoping is that we, we've picked some events, Kathy will talk more about them, that we could do, you know, if a bunch of us do that, we've identified some dates so it's more fun. We do them together as women from CWTA. So Kathy, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Well, um, uh, I am uh, thrilled to be able to talk to you all about what to do next after all of the um, inspiration from our um, leaders in in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and all of the messages that actually what we do is super important. So both inspiration and, you know, things to worry about if we don't do the work, right? So um, Indivisible Chicago Alliance is once again gearing up uh, to be robustly, yeah. robustly organizing in both Michigan and um, Wisconsin. We already are. Uh, Lavora, if she's still on, we may just have lost her. Um, we've been canvassing in Michigan already. We've been canvassing in Wisconsin. And I, I just wanna say, um, we had the biggest group of canvassers so far this season, this Saturday, two days after the debate, um, we, we knocked on probably close to a thousand doors with about 30 and a few people. And, um, and we had really good conversations with folks. Um, uh, so I just want to emphasize from what our speakers said, just how important the on the ground whether it's on the phone or um, knocking on doors is uh, just before I go into the specific things to do in, I was in Racine. We, um, we uh, folks are, they're working on what they call the persuadable universe, um, which is like infrequent voters, um, possible independents, people low information. They just don't know a lot about them. Um, uh, not super engaged. Uh, and there are 11,000 such people for that list in Racine. Um, we were out there knocking on an awful lot of their doors and having really excellent conversations. Um, you know, and what I learned is these, the folks who aren't thinking a whole lot about the election or think they're not thinking a whole lot about the election, they don't like Trump. They don't like the things that Trump is doing. They don't need to be persuaded not to vote for Trump. <laughs> but they do need to be, have conversations about, you know, why it's important for them to get out and vote. Um, and those have been, those were really good conversations with all the folks that we, that we took up on, um, on Saturday had conversations like that. Um, it was really, people felt really good about it. Um, so if you, 
I'm so we're really happy to be partnering with with uh, Chicago Women Take Action again to help to engage you all in our work. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about what it is we're doing. Um, we have we have now launched. We've got canvases going um, to Michigan and Wisconsin uh, right now, twice, four times a month, twice to each state. Um, we are launching phone banking it, it, uh, just next week or yeah, next week. Um, after the fourth, um, and we will have a phone bank a week, uh, two to Wisconsin, two to Michigan, but we will very soon ramp up to where we have, uh, probably in August, where we have um, two phone banks a week, um, two to Michigan, uh, four to Michigan, four to Wisconsin. We will have Michigan Mondays and we will have Wisconsin Wednesdays. Um, and um, that'll be another place you can join in. Um, if you have worked with us before, you know, um, that uh, Indivisible Chicago is puts a big emphasis on giving you the tools you need for, if you're a beginner at phone banking, if you're a beginner at canvassing, um, the orientations you need, the, um, uh, the background information, um, the ride you might need to Wisconsin, uh, will help you with all of those things. Um, and, um, and so we're really happy to have you and really encourage you to join with us. Um, as Deb said, um, she had been uh, thinking about days that we could all do join together in some of the events that are already scheduled. So there could be a group of um, CWTA folks in these. Deb has put a, I think, Deb, you got, is it in? I can't see it. Yes, but, it's okay. the link uh, is there's, in the chat. A, there's a link in the chat to a doc with um, several dates. Um, upcoming dates, one Michigan canvas. Um, the first one is a, is a Michigan phone bank. I mean, a Wisconsin phone bank on the 17th of July. It's actually our inaugural, inaugural Wisconsin phone bank. Um, and, um, and we're canvassing in Wisconsin on the, on Sunday, the 21st of uh, July. Um, we also have targeted a Michigan phone bank on the 8th of August. I mean, not the, 8th of August, the 5th of August and um, a canvas on the 4th of August. Um, those canvases are going to um, sort of Benton Harbor, St. Joe so far. Um, our, our Wisconsin canvases are going to Racine, Kenosha and South Milwaukee. Um, um, so I guess there's two asks of you really. One, look at this, sign up to come with us and with your fellow CWTA folks um, uh, one or more of these days and just as important and possibly more important, um, get some other people to do it too. Cause you know, you all are the easy sell and I, we should, we hope to have you all a uh, part of what we're doing. Um, we need your friends too. Um, so, to get them interested in, uh, to get them phone banking or coming with you to Canvas and knock on doors. Well, and just to say, like, I know for myself, um, <laughs> if I can make myself get in a habit, like if I decide I'm going to phone bank into Wisconsin, I might just start blocking my, if it's Wisconsin Wednesdays, I'm going to just start blocking my calendar and sort of sign up on a regular basis because that's the way, at least for me, I get into a routine. I know I'll show up. So we hope you do that. Also, you'll see in the document, because we, Kathy and I picked some days we thought were good days to get us going. We've also put in um, the link that is sort of the general mobilize a link for Indivisible Chicago. So as new events are added, you can go there and anybody who's done this with mobilize, you know, you can just scroll through and see whatever other events are too. So, um, you know, that that will keep increasing, as Kathy says, by the fall, it's going to be a lot of events. But we hope that we really get you to sign up for at least one of these first four that we've that we've picked and we can see each other there. That would be great. Let me say one more thing, which is um, it's true. I think it's always true. And it, I think it's particularly true right now. Um, uh, work right now is like the best, the best. Um, you know, people were not in the in the last throes of the um, campaign. People have not been bombarded. They haven't been called by a bunch of people. No one has 
you would be the you will be the first person to knock on their door and talk to them um, about the election, which is an important place you want to be. Um, and uh, and people are willing to talk. It's like you know they don't feel as much under pressure. Um, not that you shouldn't. We shouldn't all be working in September and October. We got to work all the way through. But but this time in the summer, I think is a particularly um, fulfilling and particularly effective time to be out trying to talk to voters. Kathy, one question. I know for Wisconsin, for people that are actually going to go up to Canvas, you've now really got it down. So like people go up in the morning, you don't lose a whole day or anything. Like you go up in the morning, you're home by mid-afternoon, I think. Right. But yeah. when, and what about Michigan? How what's that process in Michigan? Um, Michigan's been doing so we've been trying to change it up a little bit, actually, at different times because people like different uh, schedules. Right. So, uh, yes, there are there are campuses that leave first thing in the morning uh, over the weekend. Last weekend, we were in Wisconsin by nine o'clock. We were driving home by one. Um, and that meant people had a really good chunk of time. They had two and a half hours or more, you know, on the doors, which is you, you want to be able to spend a good chunk of time if you're going to drive all the way. Um, and yes, I see Susan saying Michigan is closer yeah. for Southsiders. It certainly, it is. Um, and, um, uh, but we have been changing it up so that we don't always start first thing in the morning. We don't always do Saturdays. Sometimes we do Sundays and Sundays are in the afternoon. Um, at least in the summer in Wisconsin, in the fall, you have to worry about the football games. Um, so we'll probably be less on the Sunday schedule um, then. But we have been trying to, to change it up and make it so that um, different different schedules can be accommodated. But no, you don't have to be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to take your entire day. Um, so that's true in Michigan too, right? You're just going That's to true in Michigan too. Some oh, of the Michigan yes, start Michigan. later. Some of the Michigan start at like... Um, uh, in the afternoon at noon. Um, actually, and Bill's been organizing it so that who, Bill Mangabeer, who organizes Michigan, some of the Michigans, uh, you can go for first thing in the morning canvassing. And if you want, he'll let, he'll, you know, encourage you to stay for a second shift in the afternoon, or you can head back. Most people head back, but you know, for the diehards, if you're like a, once I get there, I just want to keep going. Um, we can, you can do that too. Does anybody have any questions for, for Kathy? Oh, the, there's a lot, when you click on the links and the sign up links, you'll get more information too. And as Kathy said, Indivisible takes good care of you. So you'll get emails and more information and details and all of that once you sign up. Right. And if you've never used the, if you, know, if you, if you haven't been canvassing for a while and you haven't used the, the phone apps that are now the thing we use, um, you know, we'll orient you on those as well and give you, um, get you started. Well, great. If there's no questions, thank you, Kathy. And again, really, um, uh, if you don't sign up now, CWT, we're probably going to send this link to you <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> Do it now, you know. Um, but anyway, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and I will turn it back to Jackie. Right. Man, I'm really excited. I'm one of those fired up things. I'm sitting here next to my downer, uh, Susan. <laughs> Uh, but not to worry she's about now, it. Sorry, she said I could come over to her apartment. We live in the same building. <laughs> no, but Susan's got to be enth enthusiastically out there walking streets with me. So not to not to worry about it. But, you know, the, the thing is that there are those folks out there. I had lunch with people today that were convinced that Biden should quit the ticket. Right. And and we put someone else in. And I have to say, look, guys, come on, you can wish whatever. But let's be realistic. It's not going to happen. And besides, you know, there are seven states we have to worry about. Right. So if we get those seven states, then, you know, we'll be just fine. So quit crying in your milk and let's go and work. Like uh, Nancy Pelosi says, don't agonize organize and that's what we're going to do so you know we had good uh good pep talks and good information from from ben and from Livonia, and i think we need to take that take it to heart 
energize ourselves, energize all of your year friends who are like Susan here and get, get them out to Wisconsin and, uh, and Michigan. So, so thanks to both of them. I, I said, thank you. And they're gone now, but thank you, Kathy, uh, for, uh, for giving us the practical stuff. You know, one of the things we do these educational forums all the time, but we really want, want us to do something, right? We don't just want to be listeners. We want to be doers. So, uh, with this one, definitely, we want to be out there doing because our our democracy is at stake. You know, this is not a time to be, you know, well, maybe next time. No, no, there is no next time unless we win this time. So, you know, just uh, just remember that. So thank you all very much. I hope to see you on the phones or on the on the carpools to to Michigan or Wisconsin. And, you know, I have I just it hit me that um, uh uh, my daughter-in-law has a fellowship at Marquette and the family, the Brooklyn family is coming to hang out with me in August. So I may have a reason to go back and forth to Wisconsin, even though Michigan is closer, but we'll see. But anyway, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, have a wonderful fourth. And uh, I'll make a quick announcement. This. Sure, Betty, you can definitely do that. Okay. Uh, one of those Wednesdays in July, I'd like you guys to meet me out at uh, Buckingham Fountain on the east side, on the Michigan side, on July 17th. It's the fourth anniversary of the death of John Lewis, and we're going to have a candlelight vigil in remembrance of him at 7 o'clock. Do you know what the, what the exact date is? July Wednesday, July 17th. Wednesday, July I will 17th. send the information to Kat so she can send it out. Okay. All right. Thank also, you. Also, Jackie, um, mm -hmm. One thing I think maybe we should tell the people here is we decided, CWTA decided, we're not actually having a general meeting like this in August. And one of the dates that Kathy and I, we could be phone banking, though, instead. So one of the phone bank dates, I think, to Michigan is on the first Monday in August, because there will not be a CWTA general meeting. Exactly. And our next general meeting will be in September. And in September... We will be focusing on our election here, which is the school board elections. So if you don't know or you're not sure about school boards, make sure you join us uh, the first Monday in September, whatever that date is. Uh, that's going to be the focus of our of our work. So any other announcements? Anybody else has something for the good of the order? Um, the only thing is that it's, I think it's September 9th because the first Monday is Labor Day. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, Thank you for that. Yes. Join us. We're not meeting on Labor Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Judy, Judith, for clearing that up. Um, okay. any, anything else? And, oh, I, let me just say thank you to those of you who contributed to our Stride for Peace. Um, we, uh, we did quite well. We, we had a lot of fun out there walking. I didn't think I could walk two miles, but I did. So, you know, canvassing in Wisconsin and Michigan is going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not worried about it. So thank you. Uh, if you did contribute to, contribute to our, our, our fundraiser. And if you didn't, you always can still do that. <laughs> we, we will take donations all the time all the time anytime so uh so thank you all uh have a great fourth of july and i'm losing my voice so i probably should shut up <laughs> thank you everyone thank you,